الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to your daily halaqa uh, in which we discuss the Quran from a thematic perspective and uh, we have been dealing recently with uh, Surah An-Nisa and we have actually come right to the end of the Surah and again just to recap very quickly um, to get you up to speed uh, Surah An-Nisa is about the concept of family and how this relates to the purpose of creation. Uh, so uh, Surah An-Nisa discusses the concept of family at the level of humanity, that humanity is one family, they come from uh, one father and mother uh, and uh, their purpose and the reason for their creation was actually to make their way back to Allah and uh, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, another level of family is being discussed and that's basically uh, the level of the believers. The, the believers make one family together. Why? Because they have remained true to the purpose of their creation and that's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the surah also discusses a more detailed or, more, or a smaller unit of family which is uh, what is known as the nuclear family or a father or mother and their children and maybe as well you know a little bit of an extended family so at this level Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connects uh, the rulings that pertain to marriage divorce issues of inheritance Allah relates that to the bigger context of the purpose of our creation and that is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, so you'll find discussion of so many different things. What's beautiful and very special about Surah An-Nisa is that how these themes that are usually treated as separate, how they are uh, you know, brought together, how they are interwoven into one unit and they serve one purpose. And that shows the connection between acts of worship and between uh, rulings and between the spiritual side of our religious experience and also how this connects to our purpose in life and how we organize our lives so it's a very beautiful like it, it treats uh, human existence or the human experience at so many levels and connects them so organically and beautifully and this is what what is so special about uh, Surah An-Nisa so sometimes you'll find Allah SWT talks about the uh, the purpose of our creation and why we are here, what we are supposed to do. And he talks about the concept of taqwa and the concept of tawheed, which is worshipping the one true God. And then you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the rulings that pertain to divorce and uh, marital issues, how, how to have a good marriage and uh, the laws of inheritance. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would talk about issues that pertain to the community in general and this is when he addresses the issues or the issue of hypocrites and how they are a very destructive element to the society and how they can be handled without extreme measures. And then Allah talks about, uh, for example, the people of the scripture and how they were expected to remain and they were ordered to remain true to their message, true to the purpose of their creation. But Allah shows and clarifies how they actually went astray and they decided to take the wrong route with regards to that. Uh, so we come here to Surat, to the last, I would say, four pages of Surat and nisa almost four pages. Um, and uh, basically, it, it talks about, here there is a reference to the people of the scripture and how they were supposed to remain true to the book of Allah, to the revelation that was sent to them th through the prophets and messengers, and that uh, they were supposed to remain true to it and believe in the last prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, then Allah clarifies some of their biggest issues some of their biggest mistakes and their biggest uh, you know blasphemies and violations of the of the divine law and that's specifically when they ascribe divinity to prophet Jesus peace be upon him and claim that he is the son of God and Allah is above way above his creation and he does not have a son because he does not need a son um, and then Allah clarifies some of their as well, uh, some of their blunders in terms of uh, how they 
they sort of dealt with other nations, with people of other religions and other ethnicities, uh, and how they uh, basically made permissible for themselves that which was prohibited, and, and so on and so forth. Then Allah clarifies that among them, there has been people who uh, remained true to the truth from God. And thus these people remained sincere and when they, the true revelation came to them, they believed in it. These are the people who remained true to the scriptures. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sort of takes, in this sense, takes a wide shot here. Where Allah talks about the prophets and messengers and what their message was. And then he puts the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in context. Uh, and again here Allah then makes the reference of those people who rejected the uh, the messengerhood or the, the, the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that they are actually not true to any of the prophets and messengers and they have made a grave violation. And then there is Allah addresses the people of the book specifically. And here he addresses the issue of uh, the Trinity uh, uh, specifically. Allah, Allah mentions it specifically, the concept of Trinity and that it's a violation against the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, yes, and then Allah concludes again with inviting the people of the book, the people of the scripture, being members of the human family and then being members of the believers, of the family of the believers. And this is what they are supposed to be, so they are supposed to be truthful to that. And if they choose not to be truthful to the revelation, then what they do automatically, they are actually uh, removing themselves from, from this, this family. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes the surah with a mention of some religious rulings that, ha that, ha that have to do with, uh, with the laws of inheritance. And although for, for, for someone, for the untrained eye, this might seem like an abrupt change and, uh, and, uh, and an unexpected way to close the surah, but it actually, it's, it's so much in line with the whole rhythm of the surah of how it connects technical issues, with the spiritual issues, with the bigger frame issues, uh, so harmoniously and so smoothly that it shows that there is no separation, there is no compartmentalization in Islam for any part of it. Everything is strongly interconnected. Okay, so this is an overview of the five, uh, the four pages, the last four pages. Um, we're going to take a closer look at some of the concepts here. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم وكان الله سميعا عليما verse number one, uh, 148 Allah says Allah does not love that people publicize evil uh, in speech unless a person was wronged and oppressed and Allah indeed is all hearer and Allah is all knower and in this sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love for, and this is for the health of the community. If there is evil, if there is oppression, it is supposed to be addressed. But it's supposed to be addressed in the right channels. It is not supposed to become a public scene or a public drama. Why? Because there is a human tendency when, when there is emphasis, and this is what happens today in the media, when there's a lot of emphasis on, on, on negativity, on, the, on crimes on uh, the bad things that happen, on disasters. It actually colors people's view of life and in, in a negative, with a negative hue. And what that does, it sort of instigates the survival instincts in humans and it activates them. And thus, people start to mimic their, their, their perceived environment. So people tend to become more negative, more aggressive, um, more defensive and Again, all of that distracts them from their mission of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even takes them away from, from mental health and well-being. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when there is evil, there is injustice, it is meant to be dealt with and it's supposed to be addressed and supposed to be uh, corrected. But the issue of publicizing it and bringing that always to the public eye and making it as if it's the public narrative of how a society functions and goes is an unhealthy thing. It has 
you know, a lot of repercussions and has a huge downside to it. And this is something true. Now, there are exceptions to this, obviously, when there is a huge injustice and it needs to be brought to the public eye in order to be addressed, because otherwise it's not being treated, then maybe there are, there are exceptions like that. But Allah reminds that He is all hearer and He's all knower, that basically He hears and He knows that. And anyone who goes through injustice, never ever expect or think that Allah is unaware or Allah is ignoring your cause. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts according to His wisdom. And in this life, He allows some injustice and some evil to take place in order for this test to be complete. Because if, if everything is just perfect and everything is just good, you know, uh, people would not be, the reality of people would not be tested in order that, that it shows, that the, the, the reality shows. So people need to be tested. There has to be evil so people commit it. And there has to be injustice so, uh, so those who have the tendency to injustice will commit it. But if they were prevented from committing it, then the evil that is inside of them, the, the evil that they have chosen to be, will not show and will not be manifest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, He holds people accountable for what they have acted upon, what they have uh, brought about into this world. Then Allah says, إِن تُبْدُوا خَيْرًا أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ أَوْ تَعْفُوا عَنْ سُوءٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَفُوًا قَدِيرًا If you do something good and you display it, or you hide it because due to sincerity, because you don't want to show off, or you don't want to put yourself in a place where you are tempted to show off. And this is actually a very, a very important thing. Uh, there is, a person should always, not necessarily always, but generally speaking, a person should have a good judgment with regards to whether they should display their good deeds or some of their good deeds or not. And there is no one answer for all situations. It's something that a person has to assess every time and again, not necessarily every time, but a person has to assess whether they want to publicize. Because if, if there's a greater good in publicizing a good deed, for example, that it inst uh, encourages others to follow suit, then, well, maybe it's actually better to display that good deed. But the rule, generally speaking, that your good deeds, it's better to keep them between you and Allah. It is easier for you to maintain your sincerity and... It's, it's, a, it's a great pitfall uh, to make a display, a public display of good deeds. Because again, there, there are evil tendencies, there are weak aspects of who we, who we are as humans. And we have this tendency to fall for seeking admiration, recognition, and seeking a reputation. And uh, the, the concept of sincerity of intention is very slippery. We can easily lose sincerity in our intentions. Uh, and, and doing things in public actually heightens that tendency to, to seek you know, reputation and seek recognition. So it's better as much as possible to keep our good deeds, our, our I would say, the, the righteous part of who we are, keep it to ourselves, keep it between us and Allah. It is, it's, actually, it's actually better. But that's not to ignore that the need, there is a need of some public presence of, of goodness so that uh, you know there is a balance in what people perceive again because again this connects to the previous verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like uh, the, the public display of evil and injustice uh, because again this feeds into our system and then when it becomes our perceived reality we tend to respond in kind so if people perceive their uh, their environment as evil they tend to that tends, tends to activate more primate aspects of them, more, uh, um, the more defensive survival mode, which usually does not display, does not bring about the best in humans. Uh, and and that's, that's the issue with media today. Media capitalizes news, it's always, it always gravitates towards evil, towards crime, towards injustice. Why? Because it wants attention, and it wants drama, and it wants uh, views. And usually that's what, you know, brings about more views. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you do something good, whether you display it or, or you hide it, you keep it, you conceal it, Allah knows about it. And if you forgive injustice, if you are in a position to be able to forgive injustice, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He Himself is forgiving, although He's 
he's mighty at the same time. And here Allah, in a subtle way, Allah encourages forgiveness. But forgiveness when you are able to take your right. And that's different. Because many people forgive because they are unable to defend themselves. Or they, are, they don't have any other choice. That's probably forgiveness, but again, it's not the best type of forgiveness. Forgiveness is, as the Arabs say, al-afu inda al-maqdara, is that you pardon someone, you let them go when you have got hold of them. That's really, that's the forgiveness that really has the most profound impact and it shows uh, a very, uh, I would say, cultivated uh, self and, um, and a very elevated state of, of, of mannerism a human being has. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, some practices of the people, again, some, some of the people of the scripture who received previous revelations and how they are not handling them well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 150, <laughs> وَيَقُولُونَ نُؤْمِنُ بِبَعْضٍ وَنَكْفُرُ بِبَعْضٍ وَيُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَّخِذُوا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ سَبِيلًا أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ حَقَّ وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا Verse number 151 as well. So Allah says those who disbelieve in Allah and His messengers and they want to differentiate and separate between Allah and His messengers. They say, we believe in some prophets and messengers, not necessarily all of them. We believe in the ones that we want to believe in. We don't have to believe in all of them. And they want to take away, in, uh, like they, they seek a path in between. Allah says, these are the true disbelievers. And we have uh, prepared for the disbelievers a disgraceful punishment. And what this means, because the truth, you cannot compartmentalize the truth. You cannot sort of break it down into bits and pieces and say, I would accept this part of the truth, but I reject this part of the truth. The truth is one. Especially the truth about who we are, who Allah is, you know, who our God is, who the Creator is, what this life is about. It's the same one truth. And the prophets and messengers, they all came with the same truth. It's the same message. Allah is one in His names and attributes. He is the Creator, the Sustainer, the Provider. He's in charge of everything. He's the only one who is worthy of worship. And this is why we are created. We are created to love Him from the bottom of our hearts. We're created to display that love in the form of worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus when, when you say, well, I choose to believe in this prophet, but not that prophet, it shows again, you're not coming from a position of truth. You're not coming from a position of belief. You, are, you have some other agenda. You're just being racist, or you're just being sectarian, or you're just being, um, you're just a follower of your own desires, your own convenience. Uh, so again, this is you're not following the truth for the sake of the truth itself because there is something called the taslim, which is the essence of Islam, is complete submission to Allah, complete submission and acceptance, complete submission to the truth and acceptance of an accept, uh, acceptance of it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies this to the people of the scripture, and Allah then clarifies that people who believe in Allah and all of his prophets and messengers, and actually Every Muslim is supposed to believe in all prophets and messengers. If you disbelieve in any prophet or messenger that we know for sure was a prophet or a messenger, then you automatically lose your faith and you you're no longer a Muslim. So, so Allah says those who have believed in Allah and His messengers and they have not differentiated and they have not separated this belief in His messengers, then these are the people who would receive their true reward and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers or, or displays and exposes some of the, um, the arguments the people of the scripture displayed to, or, uh, presented the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu with. They said, bring us a book from heavens. Bring us a scripture from, from, from above, from Allah. Bring it in front of our eyes so we see it descending, the book itself. Uh, again, this was, it was not to whether to see that Prophet Muhammad came with the truth or not. He actually, the, 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 the rabbis, the, 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 the scholars of the scripture, they knew that Prophet Muhammad came with the final message. They knew that without a shadow of doubt. But they were making this demand on the Prophet for the sake of argument. 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, their ancestors, they asked Musa, Prophet Moses alayhi salam, for something greater than that. They said to Musa alayhi salam, let us see Allah face to face. Let Allah reveal himself face to face. Otherwise, we would not follow, follow you. Uh, and Allah says Allah struck them uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a lightning at that time. And then Allah says they also took the, the calf. They made a calf of gold and then they took it as a god, as an object of worship. So what do you expect from them? This kind of argumentative nature is going to, you're going to see it. So you don't want to fall for it. You want to really put it where it belongs and classify it as it truly is. And Allah says also, we have raised the side of the mountain above them in order as to be a canopy for them, a protector from, from the sun, from the heat of the sun. And we said to them, enter. We said to them, enter the, 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 the gates or the door or, or the city, that city. And uh, we said to them, do not transgress on Saturday. And we took from them a strong covenant. Then Allah says that they actually uh, violated that covenant. They did not. They did not remain true to it, and they disbelieved in the signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And not only that, they actually ended up killing, murdering prophets without truth. And then they, when the truth came to them, they rejected it because they said, "Oh, there is some kind of a seal of our hearts. There's a screen of our, our hearts, and and it's just by nature, and it's not our fault." And basically they were blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their misguidance here. Allah says, indeed Allah sealed their hearts because of their disbelief. So you will find very, uh, a minority of them would truly come to the truth. Why? Because these are the outcomes of all of their disbelief and their deeds. It actually blocks the heart from accepting the truth. So a, so a person who keeps rejecting the truth and going against it in action, in attitude and action, what happens eventually? The heart is going to seal and they would not be able to see the truth for themselves. It's just, you know, uh, it's, um, it's a punishment in kind, in kind of their actions. Then Allah also reveals some of their misdeeds. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in verse number 156, uh, And with their uh, lies, their disbelief and their lies against Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be, peace be upon her, they created a lie against her. Because again, when she came with this miraculous birth of Jesus, peace be upon him, with Isa alayhi salam, uh, some of them or many of them accused her of committing uh, fornication. Or committing yes committing fornication uh, they accused her of zina and some of them actually uh, in subsequent generations still held on to this accusation uh, and uh, she's she's exalted she's pure and exalted above their accusations then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also among their huge like mistakes and blunders وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرِيمِ this is verse number 157 وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ And their speech or their claim that they killed the Messiah, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary, the Messenger of Allah. Indeed, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him, but his likeness. They did that to the man who upon whom Allah put his likeness. So Allah put the likeness of Jesus, peace be upon him, upon one person. And it seemed that this person was the person who told, who had told on Jesus, peace be upon him, who betrayed him. And then uh, it was this person that, would, that was taken. But with regards to Isa alayhi salam, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, Allah says in the following verse, بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Allah raised him above. Allah took uh, Isa alayhi salam above. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا Allah is almighty and Allah is wise. Then Allah says about the people of the scripture وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا Some people believe in Al-Masih alayhi salam but they don't believe in the right way. They believe also in some in the 
wrong historical narrations about him, but uh, Isa السلام, will be a witness against those people on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because they did not follow his true message. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes some of their um, wrongdoings and how these wrongdoings uh, led to Allah making their, their, their law, their, their, uh, their sharia, their, uh, their legal system very strict. So Allah made so many things haram for them. Allah made it constricted for them. And also by them taking usury, which is interest, taking riba, when they had been prohibited from that and by them taking people's wealth and people's uh, money without rights and we have prepared for the disbelievers among them severe punish, punishment. Then Allah says in verse number 162 Allah says but the true the ones of true knowledge, the ones who are very well versed in knowledge among them and who, who are true and sincere in their belief, they believe in what has been revealed to you, what has been given to you, O Muhammad, and what was revealed before you. And they are the ones who truly establish the prayer and the one who gives zakah and purify themselves and they believe in Allah and the last day. These are the ones that to whom we are going to, or we, these are the ones to whom we prepared a great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the people who will receive great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his, um, his mission and Allah puts it in context. So in verse number 163, Allah says, Inna إلا إلا O Muhammad, we have revealed to you, we have sent revelation to you, just like we sent revelation to Prophet Nuh, Noah, and the prophets who came after him. And this actually shows and uh, indicates that the first messenger was uh, Nuh, السلام, Noah. السلام. Then Allah mentions the names of some of the prophets and messengers who came afterwards. He mentions Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, and Al Asbat, the, the Al Asbat. Uh, and Isa السلام, and Ayyub and Yunus and Harun and Sulaiman and Dawood. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in context that it's not something different, it's not something separate, it's a continuation. It's the culmination of revelation that was sent to all these prophets and messengers and others, other these other than these names. Allah says, وَرُسُلًا قَدْ قَصَصْنَاهُمْ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَرُسُلًا لَمْ نَقْصُصْهُمْ عَلَيْكَ وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا and there are messengers that uh, we have narrated their stories to you. And some messengers, we did not mention their stories to you. And Allah spoke to Musa السلام, directly. Then Allah says, uh, He sent the messengers and prophets to give glad tidings to those who believe and warnings to those who reject the truth. So that people who disbelieve will have no excuse on the day of judgment. And Allah says, in verse number 166, But Allah is a witness over what He revealed to you. That's enough of a witness. Allah sent that with His knowledge. Allah sent the Quran with His knowledge, with His wisdom. And the angels testify. And Allah is enough as a witness. And somebody might say, that, so what difference does this make to us humans? Because we don't hear Allah speak directly, we don't speak to Him, we don't see Him. Uh, what about Him being a witness? Well, first and foremost, it's the truth itself is valuable, regardless whether we know it or not, whether we perceive it or not. So Allah is a witness and that's more important than anything else. Number two, when Allah, Allah has a truth and He wants to reveal it to humans, He inspires them with that. And Allah inspires us through our fitrah and through our spiritual side. And this is why people recognize the truth. People who are open to the truth will recognize it, will see it. And the only ones who will miss out on the truth are the people when it comes to them. The people who will miss out on the truth when it comes to them are the ones who reject the call of the truth within them, inside of them, or they hide it, they suppress it. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, Allah talks about the people who have disbelieved in the message of uh, of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they have tried to push people away from it. That these people are in sheer misguidance, and if they do not uh, repent and fix their ways, you know there is no way to forgiveness, and Allah would not guide them except to the way of the hellfire. Then Allah addresses humanity, and here Allah addresses the family. This is the emphasis on the family, on the hum on humanity being a family, one family. Allah says in verse number one seventy, "Ya ayuha nasu qad jaaakum al rasulu bil haqi min Rabbikum fa aminu khayra lakum wa in takfuru fa inna lillahi ma fi al-samawati wal ardi wa kana Allahu aliman hakima." Allah says, "O oh, humanity, uh, the messenger has come to you with the truth from your Lord." So believe in that, it, is, it will be better for you. And if you disbelieve, then to Allah belong the heavens and the earth. And Allah is all-knowing and He's wise and mighty. Then Allah, so Allah, this is how Allah speaks to the family of humanity. And Allah here shows that, hey, I send the truth to you because that's what your family is about. That's what your existence is about, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah addresses the people of the book as they are supposed to believe because they are the ones who know the most that the message of Prophet Muhammad sallam is the truth because they have the uh, precursor to that. They had the glad tidings in their scripture. يا أهل الكتاب لا تغلوا في دينكم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate. Do not go to extremes in your religion. Um, and again, here your religion does not mean the truth. It's again what you have changed, what you have sort of emphasized of your religion to the uh, negligence with, neg neg with neglecting other aspects of it. And do not say about Allah except that which is true. إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه. Indeed, uh, the Messiah. Isa, the son of Mary, is the messenger of Allah. And he is the word of Allah. Allah said, Kun fayakun. So Allah brought him into creation by speaking the word of creation. B. Kun. His word that he sent down to Maryam, alayhi salam, Mary. وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُ And a soul that he created. A soul that he created. Sometimes some people, especially those who want to who have this uh, attraction to, to Eastern philosophies, they try to misinterpret this verse, and he's a soul from him, meaning a soul from the creation of Allah. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to say, oh, it's a piece of the soul of Allah. A'udhu billah. And this is blasphemous. A ruhun minhu here, a soul from Allah, meaning a soul from the creation of Allah. That's all it is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing exactly what the reality of Prophet Isa alayhi salam and Allah is emphasizing he's not divine. He's not Allah. He's not the son of Allah. So Allah is showing that he's a soul from and the soul is created. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَةً So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. This is the Trinity. This is, an, a, 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 this is a critique of the Trinity, a direct uh, negation and annihilation of the Trinity. Allah says, "Intahu khayran lakum. Cease. It's, it will be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahu wahid. Indeed, Allah is only one. He's the only one who is truly worthy of worship. He's the only divine one. Subhanahu ayyakuna lahu walad. Glorified be he. He's above having a son. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ardi wa kafa billahi wakila. To him belong the heavens and the earth and Allah is enough as uh, as a wakil, as someone who's in charge of everything, in charge of all affairs. Then Allah says, "La yastankif al-Masih wa yakun abd al-Lillahi wa al-Malaika tul muqarrabun." The Messiah, Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, neither the Messiah nor the angels will refuse or reject being servants or deny being, deny being servants of Allah and slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually he says, 
people will be brought to him, will be resurrected on the day of judgment and brought to him. Those who have believed and done righteous deeds, Allah shall re uh, give them their, 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 their rewards and Allah will increase them. And those who have rejected being true obedient servants to him and they, out of their arrogance obviously and rejection of the truth, they shall receive a severe punishment or a painful punishment and they will have no one to help them. Then Allah addresses humanity again, the family of humanity, verse number 174. O oh humanity, a clear proof and truth has come to you from your Lord and we have sent down to you um, a clear light. Uh, those who have believed in Allah and have held on to his, to his guidance, Allah shall enter them into His mercy and His bounty and guide them into His straight path. Then Allah concludes the verse, the Quran, the Surah with the last verse, which is verse number 176. They ask you about a specific situation in inheritance. Uh, and that's specifically when uh, a man, for example, dies and he has no relatives except for a sister. How, how to deal with the whole issue of inheritance and other, uh, and other scenarios of this situation, similar situ and similar situation. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes this surah. And with this, we have come to the end of Surah An-Nisa, inshallah. Uh, next week, we will start dealing with Surah uh, Al-Ma'idah. And again, just to bring that all of, all of that together, Surah An-Nisa was about the concept of family at three different levels, humanity, and then the level of the community of the believers, then the level of the smaller family unit, which is father and mother and their children, or the extended family as well. Allah speaks about the rulings at different levels, but uh, all the threads from all three of this connect to one thing, which is the purpose of the creation of humanity, and that's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, their creator, uh, their sustainer, that's what unites them, that's what makes them one. And this is the purpose and the reason for their, for their creation. The surah is so beautiful in weaving these different, seemingly different aspects together so nicely into one unit. I hope, inshallah, uh, this makes the surah more meaningful and uh, I would say more relatable and more accessible. Jazakumullah khair for joining us on this journey. And until we meet next week, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.